last night, um, I was hanging out with a couple guys, um, Chris Tomlin and, um, yeah, Phil Wickham, you know, a couple of guys like that. Um, there were 60,000 60, other people in the, in the building, but, um, yeah, we were hanging out and singing, and so it was kind of, you know, kind of, you can't help but belt it to the top of your lungs, you know, sing with the rest of Southern California. So pretty exciting. So I lost my voice. Bear with me as, as, uh, as I do my best today. But I want to start off with a little story. We, when I was a kid, I was in second grade living in Argentina. My parents are missionaries down there. And I had just learned to ride a bike. You may ask, Dave, why did it take you till second grade to learn to ride a bike? Well, remember, a couple weeks ago, I told you that I spent all of my fifth year of living in the back of a Pinto wagon because we were traveling all over the country raising support as missionaries. And then my next year, we were downtown San Pedro in, in Costa Rica. So that was first grade. And that, you know, too many buses and cars and taxis. And, you know, we we're right downtown. And so that is not a place to learn a bike. And so I learned it when I was in Argentina. And uh, I, I really enjoyed riding a bike. Well, after church one Sunday, it's afternoon, I go to my friend's house, and I'm wearing my little light brown suit, a little tan suit. Going, and We go to his house, and I see that he has bikes. I'm like, let's ride bikes. He's like, yeah, it's a great idea. So we, I hop on his bike. It was a little bigger than I was used to, but I was like, you know, I got this. So we, we, we ride, and, uh, and, and all the roads are cobblestone there. And so I, I saw that there's this one road, and I'm like, hey, that looks really fun. Let's go down that hill and I'm looking at it looking at the declivity saying that's awesome this is going to be a great ride down this really steep hill because we're going to be able to go fast he's like that's stupid he says that's crazy and he's because he's looking at the wall which is at the bottom of the road and there, there was a wall because there was a train platform um, you know train station platform and, and so so but I, you know, I'm not looking at that. I'm not feeling, like, what's the worst that could happen, right? And so, so I'm, you know, looking at this road and just like, let's just go. And he's like, this is dumb. I was like, let's just do it anyway. So, uh, so we go down and I'm picking up speed. And all of a sudden it's this bike that, you know, I can't really, you know, stop it as easily as this, as the little bike that I learned on. Um, but, uh, but I'm having a blast as I'm riding down this hill. Now, the good news is I didn't die. That was the good news. <laughs> of the story. The other good news is the reason why I didn't die is because there was a mound of garbage at the bottom of the hill. And it was kind of in the, not, not the sewer, but like the, the gutter. And there was all this sewer water and nastiness and mud. And, and I'm just riding down. And so that mound of garbage stopped me from hitting the wall. And, um, and, and you know, and I'm trying to stop and stop and, and it didn't work. And so I fall off the bike, land into this mound of garbage and uh, it hurt and he was able to stop because he was a little more experienced of a bike rider than I was but I end up in this mound of garbage with just sewer water all over me and mud and I had this br this light tan suit three-piece suit that is now like muddy and and wet with with gutter water and it was so disgusting I got this banana peel on my head as I'm coming out of this like I was disgusting I you know and I was like oh that was terrible and I you know and he's like yeah yeah <laughs> how did you not see that coming I was like yeah but you know what I was just thinking you know what's the worst that could happen so so this is a metaphor for life. This is the metaphor for the way a lot of us live our lives we're like hey I'm just gonna do this and it looks really fun and who cares about the consequences? And then you experience it, you, like, you crash and you burn, and you're like, ah, oh, that wasn't as fun as I was thinking. I was thinking that's because it's gonna bring me all kinds of happiness, and it didn't bring me happiness. And the problem is, a lot of times we're like, okay, well, I'm gonna do it again because the next time I think it'll be worth it. And uh, we convince ourselves to keep going down the hill over and over again. Maybe this next time I'm not gonna crash. Maybe this next time, um, it'll be worth it. Maybe this next time I'll find happiness in it. If you do that enough in life, you keep trying to find happiness in the wrong places, but insisting that it'll eventually be worth it, right? If you keep doing that, you can get to the place where you just don't believe that happiness is possible anymore. In 2006, a movie came out with Will Smith. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness. 
And it's about a man whose life falls apart and he becomes homeless. And in it, he asks the question about whether it's even possible to attain happiness. Let's watch the clip. Hello? Hey. Yeah, sorry, sorry I couldn't make it home on time. Chris. Uh, I missed my ship. Yeah, I'm, I know. I'm sorry about that. Look, um, I'm on my way right now. Are you, are you all right with, with Christopher? I'm leaving. Chris, I'm leaving. What? Did you hear what I said? I have my things together. And I'm taking our son. And we're going to leave now. I'm going to put the phone down. Linda, I'm going wait to a leave. minute. Hold we the phone. We are leaving. It was right then that I started thinking about Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence and the part about our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I remember thinking, how did he know to put the pursuit part in there? That maybe happiness is something that we can only pursue and maybe we can actually never have it no matter what. How did he know that? Linda! Linda! Catch that clip? He says, maybe happiness is something that we can only pursue, and maybe we can actually never have it, no matter what. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in this world who believe this, that after all their efforts of trying to attain happiness, it still eludes them. So they figure, well, maybe this next time I can go down that hill and I won't crash and burn this time. Maybe it's something you can only pursue. Eventually you get to that place. Maybe it's something you can only pursue, but you can't actually ever have it. Maybe that's what you've come to believe here today. And if that's the case, I have some good news for you, and that's happiness is possible. It really is possible. The biblical definition of of happiness is deep contentment. Another word for it is blessedness. Another definition is true joy. It's something that stays. It's something that's permanent, okay? And I know some people define happiness as something that, that, that it's based on something that happens to you, whereas joy is something that, that's consistent. But in this context, in this passage that we're looking at today, happiness and joy are interchangeable. Happiness and deep contentment are interchangeable. Happiness and blessedness are interchangeable. But a lot of people don't have happiness. Why? because they have the wrong recipe, okay? So what's the recipe for happiness? If you wanna write this in, grab your notes. We got a few fill-ins today. How do we find true joy? We'll find the answer or the ingredients for our, in our text today, we're gonna to find the ingredients for how to find true happiness, how to find true joy, okay? Psalm 1-1, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the, the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So the first ingredient, if just imagine that you're in a kitchen, you've got all, you've got a big bowl there ready to throw all the ingredients in. It's only three ingredients, okay? The first one is quit buddying up with the joy thieves, okay? When you became a Christian, you got joy the moment that you became a Christian, 
And you just need to avoid the joy thieves, all right? Yeah, notice here in this text, what does it say? It says, uh, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. And then there's a progression there, right? So you begin by walking, and then you just kind of stand in the way of sinners. And then what happens? Then you sit in the company of mockers, right? There's a progression there. You become more and more comfortable with sin. You become more and more comfortable with the joy thieves, okay? Blessed or happy is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the God, in the counsel of the ungodly. You're happy if you avoid these things. When I was in was years ago, I was in speaking at a church in, in Pittsburgh, and, and uh, something happened with my flight, and and somehow throughout the night, I had like six hours to kill. It was just like a, I didn't rescheduled for the next morning. And so I was just like, well, I'm not going to stay in the airport until, you know, until my flight. I'm going to, you know, go explore Pittsburgh for a little bit. So I, I go, I can't remember how I got there. I can't remember if I rode in a cab for a little bit or if I, if it was in walking distance, but, but I ended up there at, at this casino because it's the only thing that's open in Pittsburgh between those hours of midnight and six in the morning. And so it's like three, four in the morning and, and I'm just walking around. A, see a casino, I was like, ah, I'm going to the casino because that's the only thing that's open. And so I walk in and, um, and I just walk around and, and I discover that there's this soda fountain machine that gives you free soda. It was awesome. Now, now the casino wasn't that great because it didn't have Dr. Pepper, but I do remember <laughs> that there was Pepsi there, so it's, it's not bad, right? So, so I, you know, I, you know, I, I, and I asked, I was like, is this free? They're like, yeah, yeah, take, take as much as you want. So I was like, this is awesome. So I, so I fill up and I, I get me some, uh, some Pepsi and I'm walking around just watching people, you know, make money, lose money. And it was just kind of an an entertaining hour of just walking around a casino, right, with my Pepsi, and and, uh, and then I'd go back to the to the fountain machine, and uh, and I'd get get some more Pepsi and drink a little bit more, and it was awesome. It was a great night, just kind of entertaining, you know. It's just me and me, right? It's just just uh, enjoying the time, and so then I I'm going out of the place, and I go down the the elevator, and another guy hops in the elevator before uh, as I get in, and and he's shaking. He'd had, you know, he, he was one of those, he had a really, really rough night. You could see it all over him, just the look on his face and the, and the sweat and the jitters. And, and he's just like breathing heavily. And, and, uh, and he looks at me, he goes, did you have a rough night too? And I said, I actually came out ahead tonight, which is true because I came out like 44 ounces of Pepsi <laughs> ahead in my body. It was awesome. Like I, I was a winner that night. I, I Say what you will, I won that night. And so, um, so you know, and, you know, he was, he was just like, ah, oh, and I had a really, really rough night. And, and I, I just saw the joy was stolen from this guy. It was this, this joy thief that just came and, 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 you know, stole the life out of this guy. It stole the joy out of it. His, his joy thief, I don't know what the root of it was, but, but maybe it was the, the love of money. Like the Bible talks about how the love of money is the, the root of all kinds of evil, right? Maybe his joy thief was, was needing to be the smartest man in the room, right? To outsmart the, the room. Maybe his joy thief was looking for a dopamine high as a source of happiness. Maybe his joy thief was fitting in with his friends who are all having fun. I don't know. I don't know what the story is. I don't know what his root motivation was for being there, but it was definitely stealing his joy. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that going to a casino is wrong in and of itself, right? What is dangerous is buddying up with joy thieves. If there's something in your life that's stealing your joy, it's not worth it, okay? There are certain things that will just suck the joy out of our lives. Going to a casino, again, can be just as wrong as taking a night class at a community college. If your true motivation for taking the night class at the community college is hanging out with the person that's not your spouse, right? That could be, that can steal the joy out of you just as much, right? It could be just as wrong. Fun at first, but in the end, it becomes a joy thief, right? In the end, it steals the life out of you. Do I need to list all the things that can steal joy? I don't think so. I think we all get it. I think we can all think of things and are like, yeah, I thought that was going to promise me all kinds of happiness, and it didn't, right? 
Am I the only one here that can think through my life and be like, oh, you know, I, yeah, I thought that was going to bring me joy. I thought that was going to bring me happiness. It didn't. It stole my joy. All right? Fun at first, but in the end, it's a joy thief. What's the next thing that we're encouraged to do in this text? We're supposed to delight in the law of the Lord. But how do we do that? The answer is found right there in the text, in the next line. Anyone see the verb there? What's the verb? Meditate on his law day and night. Verse 2. There is a negative kind of meditation. I just want to throw this out as an aside, but that's when you're trying to empty your mind. There's something very dangerous about that, spiritually dangerous. It opens you up to the demonic. Um, there's, there's a danger in emptying your mind. You're making yourself vulnerable to, to the spiritual realm in a way that you just don't want to. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about meditating on the word of God. That's the good kind of meditation. You're reading God's word, and you're thinking about it. And then you read some more, and you think some more about it, okay? That's the opposite of emptying your mind. You're actually filling it with the word of God, okay? And the word that's used here is the word haga, which speaks of what a cow does when it chews the cud. And it chews and it chews until it gets all of the nutrients out of it, okay? So that's how you delight in the Lord. You root yourself in God's word. You read and you think, and you read and you think like a cow chewing the cud, okay? It's a very similar process to writing a sermon. People ask, like, how do you write a sermon? And, and just real, real simply, it, 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 I have a very simple, two simple rules of thumb. The first is I read my text, whatever my text is, I read it 10 times over and over and over, and then I just start asking questions. I ask questions about the text, and, and, and you know, after 15, 20 hours throughout the week, I'm, I, you know, I eventually have all kinds of raw material. I'm just like, I am so excited about this raw material, and then it's kind of fun to put it together and put it in, and package it as, as a sermon. But I know I'm ready to preach it when I'm really excited about it. I know that I'm ready to preach it when it's like, ah, this is going to be fun, right? Sometimes, I, I'll actually, this happened a couple of weeks ago, I was reading the text, and I actually, something jumped off the page that I'd never even noticed it before, and I'd read it countless times, but as I was reading it for you, I was like, oh man, I never even noticed that word in there, that, that's such a cool element right there, and I didn't have time to like delve into it and explain it to you, but, but in my mind, I'm like, that is really a cool moment, and that's what's so cool about scripture is it's so multifaceted that it speaks to you every time you go through it. The question isn't, how many times have I gone through the Bible? The question is, how many times has the Bible gone through me, Okay. There's something so powerful about that. Like, scripture is God breathed. And so it's not like, oh, okay, I read it once. And so I kind of know what it's all about. No, like every time you read through it, there's an, you're, you're getting something new out of it. Every time you read and you think, it's kind of like a cow chewing the cud. You're, you're getting the nutrients out of it. And does a cow ever eat fast? Never. It, it, it slowly chews and slowly chews and it gets the nutrients out. And, and that's what the word picture is for us. Yes, get connected to the word of God. Read and think and slow down and read and think. And you're meditating. That word meditate is like a cow chewing the cut. You just take your time. Stop. Think about it. Slow down. Think about it. Happiness is based on what happens inside you, not what happens outside of you, okay? The, the word picture here, the next word picture is a, is a tree that gets rooted by a river, right? The source of life. And then what happens to the tree? It gets strength and it gets stability. And that comes from what it's connected to, okay? Has, it, it's based on your internals, not your externals. So the question is, what are you connected to? What are you attached to? Jesus said, abide in me and you'll bear much fruit, right? So what's the solution? What's the verb we need to be focused on? Bearing fruit? No. Abiding, right? It just, we just got to stay connected to Jesus. We just got to stay connected to the Lord and, uh, and our roots will go deep. If your roots go deep into the word of God, then there will be stability to your life. Deep contentment, true joy, the real kind of happiness. Contrast that with chaff. 
Does anyone know what chaff is? I know Phil knows because you were because you were raised on a farm. But uh, yeah, this, I, it was fascinating. A few years ago, Melissa and I were were on the uh, on our balcony, and, and she took some grain and she had a bowl, and she's like, "Dave, check this out!" And she was taking some grain, throwing it up in the air. And there was all these little filaments that were on the grain, and though there was a light breeze, and the breeze just blew away the chaff, blew away the, the little filaments. And I was like, that is so cool. I'd read this text, I'd, I'd memorized it, but I never really saw chaff. I just never had that mental picture. And then here she is throwing the grains up, and the grain falls back into the bowl, but the, but the filaments, the, the chaff, just kind of went wherever the wind blew, Okay. Same with us. If we're not rooted in the word of God, we go wherever the wind blows us, right? Political winds, social winds, cultural winds blow us wherever wherever they want to, right? But if we're rooted in the word of God, then when times of dryness comes, our roots go deep as they find water. Anyone ever heard of the tree of Tenera before? It's the loneliest tree in the world. The closest tree to it is 250 miles away. It's in Niger, Africa, in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And it used to be a part of a grove of trees. But as the region got hotter, all the other trees died. And the tree of Tenera not only survived, but it actually thrived. How did it manage that in such a harsh environment? When they dug a well there in 1938, they found that as they were digging down, they found that the tree of Tenera's roots had gone down through 100 feet of sand to find water. And because of that, it was able to thrive and survive, even though there was no other trees for 200 miles away. Now, I just got to say, don't go hopping on a plane to go find the tree of Tenera in Niger, Africa. You're going to see the world's most isolated tree. Because in 1973, there was a Libyan truck driver who was driving drunk across the Sahara. And yes, it's hard to believe, but he hit the only tree in 250 mile radius. How do you hit the only tree? You guys, that takes so much skill to hit the only tree. He hit the tree and killed the tree. So now it's not the most isolated tree in the world. Now the most isolated tree in the world is down in Antarctica or, you know, off the, uh, the islands of, of New Zealand. But, but, uh, but he, he did it. He killed the only tree within a 250 mile radius because he was driving drunk. So that kind of kills my illustration too. Like, hey, what does that mean for us? You're like, okay, I got connected to the Lord. Someone's going to hit me and kill me. Okay, no. The point is that if our lives are rooted in the word of God, then when times of dryness comes, our roots go deeper and there's a deep contentment, true joy and happiness. That will characterize our lives, okay? It doesn't mean you're always going to be laughing. It just means that it, it characterizes your life, that there's going to be a peace, there's going to be a joy even through the tough times. All right, so if that illustration doesn't work for you, there's another kind of tree. Has anyone ever heard of the DVDV trees? These are in Aruba. Anyone ever been to Aruba? Yeah. Do you remember these trees? They're on the beach, and uh, there's a whole bunch of them that just kind of face the direction that the wind is always blowing, and you're like, how does it not blow over? Well, it's because the roots are so deep. There's your... Same illustration, just with a different kind of tree, right? And, and so you may ask the question, how do I know if I'm rooted in Christ? The real answer is, is if when tragedy comes, you run to God and you discover not painlessness, but you discover true joy. Being a Christian doesn't mean not being sad, right? When I was in high school, I had a friend who accidentally shot himself. He was cleaning his dad's gun and the gun went off, hit the steel girder above him and uh, the bullet bounced into the top of his skull and, and uh, killed him. It was a tragic, tragic death. And I had walked, to him, walked with him to school that morning and it was, he was one of my best friends and uh, just, just crushed me. It was, it was so, so sad. And I remember going to the memorial service and, and another one of my friends saw that I'm like fighting tears and he saw that I was so so sad. And, and, and he's, he's like, Dave, he goes, he goes how did, how did, why did the chicken cross the road? And he, he tries to tell me these jokes to get kind of 
lift my spirits or something. I don't know. I wanted to punch him is what, what happened. I was just so angry at him because he was, he was, he was just trying to make me laugh. And, and I felt like what his, his thinking was, like, just don't be sad. Whatever you do, don't be sad, right? And sometimes we can have that same attitude, like, okay, I just got to be sadless. You know? I just got to make sure that I never get sad. But being a, being a Christian doesn't mean you never get sad. It means having deep roots in the Word of God so that you can have joy through any storm that comes your way. So the first ingredient, did you get them? Avoid the joy thieves. The second ingredient, get rooted in the Word of God. And then the third ingredient isn't really explicit in this text, but it's, it's a point that I'm going to draw from, from a text that, where Jesus talks about happiness, and that is... And the Beatitudes. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are, he's basically talking about happiness. This is the path to happiness. He talks about happiness and his point is pursue God above happiness and you'll get happiness. Okay? Another word for happiness is blessedness. And Jesus doesn't say blessed are the, or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for blessedness right? He doesn't say, happy are those who hunger and thirst for happiness. What does he say? He says, blessed are those, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yeah. Completely different, right? Tim Tim Keller, Melissa's and my favorite preacher says it this way. He says, if you seek righteousness over happiness, you get both. If you seek happiness over righteousness, you get neither, right? Because happiness is a byproduct of pursuing God over happiness. It's counterintuitive. It's, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It, in the natural, it doesn't make sense. But in the spiritual, this is the way it works. You pursue God, you get joy. You pursue God, you get happiness, okay? If you pursue happiness, what happens? You miss it, right? If you pursue happiness over God, you miss God and you miss happiness, so the point is, try, try to stop trying to be happy. I know it's weird to say it that way. But if you stop trying to be happy, you will actually be on the path to happiness. Does anyone remember Aesop's fable, the dog and the bone? The dog's carrying a bone, and he gets to the bridge, and he looks over into the water, and he sees another dog holding a bone. It's his reflection. But he wants the bone from that other dog. And so he lets go of the bone so that he can grab the other dog's bone. Loses both, right? Same thing here. What happens if we pursue happiness over God? We, we miss out on both. We miss out on God. We miss out on happiness. But if we pursue God over happiness, we get both. If I pursue happiness over God, there's several things that could happen. I, I, I might over-medicate myself. If happiness is my ultimate goal, I might turn to substance abuse or some other addiction. If happiness is my ultimate goal, I might cheat. I might lie. Why? Because I'm pursuing happiness over righteousness or over God, right? And I can say, yeah, I believe in honesty. I believe in integrity. I believe in purity. I believe in telling the truth and all that. But not if it means I'm going to lose my job, right? Uh, not if it means I'm going to lose my girlfriend. Not, nah, not if I'm going to lose. You know, we can have a whole bunch of things that we care about in life. And, and, and we believe in all those good things, honesty and all that. But uh, if it means that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail the test, uh, maybe I don't really believe in integrity that much at that point. Right? We cheat and we lie because our one guiding principle is to be happy above everything else. And if happiness is our one guiding principle, we're never going to be happy. The person who is happy is the one who has stopped trying to be happy. Just pursue God, okay? Just pursue God and you get both, okay? So those are the ingredients in your, your spiritual kitchen bowl that you got in front of you right now. You just avoid the joy thieves. That's the first ingredient. Second, get rooted in the Word of God. And I just want to encourage you with that. Take your time. Like, I gave you a challenge a little over a year ago or a little less than a year ago, I guess it was, um, to read through the Bible. Awesome. Several people have been doing that. You know, uh, 
one of us is actually, uh, he, Reuben is actually on his second time through the Bible. Awesome. So, you know, but I would rather, I would rather you take the time and actually meditate on the word. And, I was, and I'm not saying there's nothing, anything wrong with reading through the Bible in a year. But we, even with that challenge, that challenge aside, I'd, I would rather have you slow down and actually meditate on the word of God. Let it, you know, like a cow chewing the cut. Just let it, take your time as you go through it. Let it get into your heart. That'll change you. Avoid the joy thieves. Get rooted in the word of God. And then stop trying to be happy. (laughs) And you'll be on the path to happy. Just pursue God first. Avoid the joy thieves. Get rooted in the word of God. And then mix all that up in your spiritual bowl that you got. And enjoy your new life. You're going to find that there's all kinds of joy. There's a, there's a deep contentment. There's deep happiness as we live that way. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you that happiness is possible, and it's, uh, it comes from a relationship with you. I, I pray, Father, that you will help all of us to, to increase our joy quotient in our lives as we, as we love you, as we, as we avoid the things that are joy killers. Um, joy thieves Lord help us to stay away from those things but as we get rooted in your word um, Lord I ask, that you, I ask that you'll give all of us collectively a, 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 a love for the word of God may it become exciting to us may what we read whatever we're reading may it become exciting to us and Lord help us to put you first above everything else um Lord, we want to live for you. We want our lives to reflect you. We want our lives to be joyous. Um, so our eyes are on you. Lord, lead us as, uh, as our eyes are on you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said...